Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Um, and welcome to this session where we're going to talk about some of the work that we're doing in the CNCF um, storage SIG, covering um, a view of uh, the landscape, the projects, the technology that, that we're working on, um, and some of the interesting things that are happening in the CNCF relating to storage. Um, my name is uh, Alex Kirkop, um, and I'm the CEO of Storage OS and one of the co-chairs of the Storage SIG, and I'm here with uh, Jing Yang, um, and I'll let Jing make a quick intro. Thanks, Alex. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Xing Yang. I work at VMware in the Cloud Native Storage team. I'm a co-chair of Kubernetes SIG Storage, and also working with Alex in the CNCX Storage SIG. Brilliant. Thanks, Xing. Um, so, Today, we're going to cover a little bit um, about how the SIG works, um, how you can join in, and how you can help. Uh, we're going to cover off some of the projects that are part of the um, storage landscape in the CNCF and some of the projects that are going through review. Um, and we'll also talk about um, some of the documents uh, uh, and, and other contents that we're working on, like the storage landscape documents and the performance and the disaster recovery documents, which, which hopefully will, will, will um, spark some uh, involvement and questions uh, and we'd love to hear back from you. So the storage SIG um, is, uh, works with the CNCF TOC. Um, we hold meetings every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, all of our calls um, and membership uh, are open. Um, we share our agenda, our, uh, the recordings for all the sessions, um, and we have a, a, an open mailing list. And we'd, we'd, we'd really like you to would really like you to join, and we'll, we'll share some information on how to do that in a second. Um, so, who are we? Um, there's a diverse group of people who form uh, the SIG. Um, they, some are independent contributors, some are um, uh, working for different vendors or, or, or organizations, but in general, we're all leaders and early adopters in the, in the storage space. Um, at the moment, our co-chairs are, are myself, Quinton and Xing. Um, we have uh, Raphael, Luis and, and Sheng as, as tech leads, um, and Saad and Darren work as, as talk liaisons. And together, we, we cover um, a range of important functions uh, for the storage space and the TOC. Um, the, the important thing here is we, we provide that um, storage uh, um, uh, experience and, uh, and advisory services to, to the TOC, um, as well as providing um, a number of um, uh, a number of documents and other educational materials to the end user community. At the end of the day, we, we want our mission is, is to be able to um, improve the number of projects in the storage space and improve the adoption of, of cloud native storage um, in, in environments for the CNCF. So a large part um, of the work we do is to provide um, easy to read documentation and materials that help end users understand all the different technologies. The, the landscape is, is a, 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 wide, a vast and um, varied uh, uh, projects and, and technologies. Um, and so, you know, it's really important to, to try and document that and cover all of the different products and practices and trends and technologies, etc. That, that we have uh, that we have in the environment. Two of the important documents that we have provide that we have provided are the CNCF um, storage white paper, um, and Jing will go through that uh, in a, in a shortly, um, as well as some new documents like the performance and benchmarking white paper, which are um, developments and following feedback from from our original um, storage white paper. As much as possible, the information that we're providing um, is, is based on, on, on research and the collective experience of, of the tech leads and the community within the SIG. Another important role that the SIG is responsible for is the um, helping the TOC 
evaluate um, projects. In the CNCF, we have three classes of projects. Um, there are sandbox projects, there are incubation projects, and there are graduation projects. Um, sandbox projects are there um, to provide uh, an experimental um, zone uh, within the CNCF to allow collaboration and allow projects to, to build their community. The idea is that sandbox projects have a low barrier to entry and they help um, and they help the projects um, build and, and, and perhaps ratify things like their licensing and IP policies to be compatible with the CNCF. Incubation projects are where um, we do a lot of due diligence. Uh, incubation projects are projects that need to be successfully used in production by a number of organizations. Um, and we also uh, evaluate the technology and some of the, um, uh, the project metrics in terms of you know, things like the committers and the health of the project in terms of having regular, uh, regular updates. Um, once uh, a project has been in incubation for a while, it can graduate. Uh, graduate means that graduation means a graduated project means that um, the project is in mainstream production use and it's uh, recommended for production use. Graduated projects, for example, include um, Kubernetes. Um, and graduation also um, means that the CNCF is um, is confident about the security where they pr provide uh, security orders for the project and also with the governance of the project to ensure that there are multiple committers. So as a SIG, we help the TOC uh, review and, and document the, the, the different projects as they go through um, this, this life cycle uh, within the environment. Um, when, when a project goes through um, uh, incubation, for example, we uh, we, we usually have the project present to the, to the SIG um, and following that presentation uh, and a review with the SIG um, will provide um, a recommendation to the TOC um, to move forward with uh, due diligence. The due diligence involves um, both uh, technology and governance reviews as well as interviews with, with production users. Um, and then ultimately the TOC will, will vote to enable the project to, to, to go into incubation. One important point to note here is that the, the SIG is also um, uh, very keen to learn about new projects and new open source projects in the storage space. Um, so we often have presentations from, from projects who are interested in joining the CNCF, um, either at incubation or, or at Sandbox. Um, and those and those presentations um, are provides you know valuable material and valuable input to the to the TOC in in in, in their uh, decision making process. Another thing that we do is we um, we run surveys and we work with the end user um, community in the in the CNCF um, to to understand what's important to them. Um, where we can help, uh, and that can be, you know, in terms of creating uh, white papers or other or other documentation. It could also be um, in terms of uh, seeking out uh, projects to 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 present to the to the CNCF. And we do all of this um, in a very open way, where uh, all of our meetings, um, our agendas, mailing lists, etc., are all done in the open. Um, and and it's and and we and we publish all of those um, links in the CNCF storage SIG uh, repo on GitHub. One thing to bear in mind is that whilst we're considered um, advisors to to the TOC and we help with the technical uh, due diligence as well as um, in uh, re project reviews um, during their life cycle within the CNCF. Um, we're we are advisors, and 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 that is the key, and that is the key uh, point here. So so ultimately, in all cases, the TOC are responsible for making uh, the final decisions um, in any in any uh, in any project uh, adoption or project review process. So how can you get involved? Well, 
we have we have a fantastic community. We cover um, a huge range of different topics, everything from uh, management frameworks and and and, and, and tooling. Um, block stores, file systems, object stores, uh, key value stores, databases, storage in cloud native storage is, is um, covers covers a wide variety of, of topics and would be very interested to to hear from you. Please do consider joining our meeting and signing up to to our mailing list. Um, if for nothing else, yeah, it's you, you'll probably find it extremely valuable to see some of the project presentations that have presented to the SIG in the past, um, which have covered a lot of these different technology areas. With this, I'll hand over to, to Shane, who's going to cover off um, some of the CNCF storage projects that we've been talking about. Thanks, Alex. I'm going to talk about Graduated and Incubating Storage Projects. Zhuk is a graduated project. It provides storage operators for Kubernetes. Zhuk turns distributed storage systems into self-managing, self-scaling, and self-healing storage services. Zhuk orchestrates multiple storage solutions, each with a specialized Kubernetes operator to automate management. It currently supports Ceph, Cassandra, and NFS. Vitas is a graduated project. It is a cloud native database system for deploying, scaling, and manage large clusters of database instances. It supports MySQL and MariaDB. It combines and extends many important SQL features with the scalability of a NoSQL database. ETCD is a graduated project. It is a distributed key that you store that provides a reliable way to store data across a cluster of machines. All Kubernetes clusters use ETCD as their primary data store. It handles storing and replicating data for Kubernetes cluster state and uses the raft consensus algorithm to recover from hardware failure and network partitions. TechEV is a graduated project. TechEV is an open source distributed transactional key value database built in Rust. It provides transactional key value APIs with asset guarantees. The project provides a unifying distributed storage layer for cloud native applications. It can also be deployed on top of Kubernetes with an operator. Dragonfly is an incubating project. It is also a project under SIG Runtime. Dragonfly is an open source cloud native image and file distribution system. It was originally created to improve the user experience of image and file distribution in Kubernetes. We also have a few sandbox storage projects. TrueFS is a cloud native storage platform that provides both POSIX compliant and S3 compatible interfaces. Project Langhorn implements distributed block storage using containers and microservices. Langhorn creates a dedicated storage controller for each block device volume and synchronously replicate the volume across multiple replicas stored on multiple nodes. Project Open EPS builds on Kubernetes to enable safe applications to easily access dynamic local PVs or replicated PVs using the container attached storage pattern. Project Prius is the cloud native storage system that enables Kubernetes local persistent volumes with dynamic provisioning, resource management, and high availability. And Project uh, Provega is an open source distributed storage service implementing streams. It offers stream as the main primitive for the foundation of storage systems. Next, please. We have several sandbox projects that are applying for incubation status. They are currently being reviewed. Next, please. Now I'm going to talk about the CNCF storage white paper. In this white paper, we described storage system attributes 
different layers in the storage solution and how they affect the storage attributes. We talked about the definition of data access interfaces and management interfaces. Next, please. Storage systems have several storage attributes, availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Availability of a storage system defines the ability to access the data during failure conditions. Scalability of a storage system can be measured by a number of criteria. The ability to scale the number of clients, the ability to scale throughput or number of operations, the ability to scale the capacity in terms of data stored of a single deployment, or the ability to scale the number of components. Similarly, the performance of a storage system can be measured against different criteria. Latency to perform a storage operation, the number of storage operations that are possible per second, and the throughput of data that can be stored or retrieved per second. Consistency attributes of a storage system refer to the ability to access newly created data or updates to the same after it has been committed. This applies to both read operations and any delays that occur between performing the data storage operation and the data getting committed. Systems that have delays are defined as being eventual consistent. If there are no delays, the system is defined as being strongly consistent. Durability is affected by the data protection layers, level of redundancy, the endurance characteristics of the storage media storing the data, and the ability to detect corruption of data and the ability to rebuild or recover the data. Next, please. There are several storage layers that can impact the storage attributes. For example, rather than directly access resources, a hypervisor can provide access to resources, which could add access overhead. Storage topology describes the arrangement of storage and compute resources and the data link between them. This includes centralized, distributed, sharded, or hyper-converged topologies. Storage systems usually have data protection layer, which adds redundancy. This refers to RAID, erasure coding, or replicas. Storage systems usually provide data services in addition to the core storage functions, including replication, snapshots, clones, and so on. Storage system ultimately processes data on physical storage layer, which is usually non-volatile. It has impact on overall performance and the long-term durability. Next, please. In this diagram, we can see that workloads consume storage through different data access interfaces. There are two categories of data access interfaces here. We call them volumes and API. CO has interfaces for volumes, which supports both block and file system. In Kubernetes, there are two volume modes, file system and block. File system mode allows workloads to consume file system directly. Underneath, it can be either file system or block. Block mode allows raw block device to be consumed directly by the workload. On the API, we have object store API that stores or retrieves objects or blobs. It is usually a HTTP interface. It has a distributed architecture. It is optimized for capacity, durability, and scalability. It could also have a high latency and high throughput. Note that there is a Kubernetes Seek storage subproject called Cozy, which introduces Kubernetes APIs to support orchestration of object store operations for Kubernetes workloads. Therefore, bring in object storage as the first class citizen in Kubernetes, just like file and block storage. It also introduces container object storage interface or Cozy as a set of gRPC interfaces for provisioning object stores. It is targeting alpha in Kubernetes 1.22 release. Under API, we also have key value stores, which use an API to store retrieve values from stores based on a key. It supports strong consistency. It's typically used to store state or configuration for distributed systems. 
On the API, we have databases. Databases are typically accessed through an API. In the past, the term database used to be synonymous to a relational database. However, there are now many new SQL systems, as well as specialized ones like graph databases that get categorized as databases. In the meantime, existing relational databases such as PostgreSQL and MySQL have been going in the opposite direction, allowing storing data without a fixed schema. Not all databases are cloud native. Some databases may not be inherently built to run in cloud native environment like Kubernetes. This can typically be addressed with additional tooling like the use of proxies and orchestration systems that allow them to better suited to run in a cloud native environment. Next, please. Now let's take a look of the orchestration and management interfaces. This diagram shows workloads consume storage through data access interfaces. There are two ways for storage system to interact with container orchestration systems. The darker green box here, control plane interfaces, refers to storage interface directly supported by SEALs, including container storage interface, CSI, Docker volume driver interface, and so on. Note that Kubernetes in Kubernetes Entry volume plugins and flux volumes are deprecated. Kubernetes 6 storage is working on migrating entry volume plugins to CSI drivers. CSI is an industry standard to define a set of storage interfaces so that a storage vendor can write one plugin and have it work across a range of container orchestration systems such as Kubernetes. CSI has three gRPC services, controller, node, and identity services. Identity service provides info and capabilities of a plugin. Controller service supports create and delete volume, create and delete snapshot, and attach and detach volume, and so on. Node service supports mount and unmount volume. Ex expand volume and volume house support are in both controller and node services. The orange box here is called frameworks and tools. This is an extension of control plane interfaces. In addition to provisioning, these interfaces could provide functionalities such as discovery, automation, data services such as data protection, disaster recovery, data migration, and data lifecycle management, and so on. For application API, including key value store and databases, CEOs currently don't have direct interfaces for it yet, but some frameworks and tools have support for them. For example, Rook supports Cassandra. Vitas has an operator to manage MySQL clusters. Now I'm going to hand it over to Alex to talk about the performance white paper. Great, thanks, Ling. Um, so, in the once we once the SIG had put together the white paper, the storage white paper that uh, that Jing has just um, summarized. We decided to look at some of the attributes and, and dive in uh, into a bit more depth um, for some of the uh, some of the detail um, relating to to the attributes and, and one of those attributes, of course, is performance, which which actually, of course, does tie in in many ways to um, things like consistency and and, and availability and, and scalability too. Um, we 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 realize that the performance was one of those um hard things to to understand and and benchmarking and understanding the performance of the system was was fairly complex so what we decided to do was was to dive in and, and, and write a document that covered some of the common concepts for um measuring the performance and benchmarking for both um volumes and databases and and, and we focused on on, on those two to start with, and we will probably um, add uh, other types of storage uh, in the future. One of the one of the things that we realized as we as we were talking about um, the different uh, options and tools that that could be used to to measure performance and benchmarking within cloud native environments was that there actually is um, a number of of problematic common pitfalls that, that, that a lot of people 
um, uh, fall into. Um, so we we decided to to um, spend quite a bit of time documenting um, some of these potential issues and some of the things that um, uh, that it's useful to be aware of when when you're measuring performance of of different systems, and especially when you're comparing the performance of of different systems. Um, of course, it's important to understand you know some of the basics. Um, when Jing was describing those attributes, you know, we could see that um, the attributes can can be measured um, across multiple axes, um, perhaps operations per second, um, uh, and also throughput. Um, and it's probably fair to say that um, you need to have an understanding of your use case to be able to understand which of operations and throughput are more important to to, to your environment. So for example, um, analytics might might um, might be very focused on, on throughput uh, in terms of you know megabytes or gigabytes per second, uh, whereas uh, databases or, or, or message queues, for example, might be um, much more heavily dependent on being able to implement a large number of operations per second. And of course, you know, we we saw the different attributes and and the different layers in this in the storage um, paper, um, and and that of course translates to uh, different challenges uh, in in performance too. So, understanding the topology, like for example, is the data local or or remote, um, uh, can can affect can affect performance quite uh, quite dramatically. The different topologies in terms of um, sharding or, or hyperconverged as well have 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 similar sort of uh, impacts. Um, data protection, having having commonality on, on data protection, is 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 another key aspect. So, whether the data is whether the storage system is um, implementing some sort of replication or or perhaps erasure coding um, has a big factor in the performance. Uh, data reduction. Can also um, can also impact performance in 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 many different ways. So, for example, if a storage system is implementing um, data reduction in terms of you know compression or, or deduplication, um, it's important to understand the type of data that you're using to store in that system. Because <clears throat> um, if if your if if your benchmark is storing all zeros for the sake of argument. Um, you know that compresses particularly well and and gives you uh, a, a false a false reading in terms of the performance. Um, and of course, if you're running in the cloud and you're implementing um, services like like encryption, uh, that's also a factor to 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 be to be aware of. Another big factor which which um, is poorly understood is the is the concept of latency. So how you access the data and how the data is protected all impacts um, latency in terms of how long it takes to implement a specific um, operation. Uh, that can be, you know, the, that can be measured in, in microseconds or, 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 or milliseconds typically. Um, and that gives you an idea of um, the number of uh, operations per second. But, but very often, if you're, if you're thinking about um, operations on a website or um, the number of database transactions that can be um, uh, run through a system latency is often is often the the key measurement uh, that you'll want to focus on as, as that the low latency has a direct um, relation to the number of transactions per second that a system uh, can implement um, of course the performance um, has is also dependent on the concurrency of the environment. So understanding things like the, the queue depths on a volume and how many clients are, are, are issuing requests in parallel and how many um, and, and how many backends the, the storage is, is sharded or, or replicates across um, makes makes a huge difference. Um, so if the application is, is able to uh, utilize the concurrency um, within the storage environment, um, then you can maximize the number of operations or throughput. Um, but if the application is is very serialized, for example, then then it can't make use of that concurrency. One other big factor is is caching. This can happen at multiple layers um, within the storage 
uh, within the storage topology, starting from you know the operating system layer and, and, and file system caches, uh, all the way down to you know different um, storage layers uh, and different storage subsystem layers. Um, and caching is is one of those things that often catches people out when they're doing when they're doing benchmarks, um, and that's because um, for practicality reasons, they might be testing volumes or databases of a small size to allow to allow the benchmark to to happen easily. But of course, if the data set that you're testing is significantly smaller than the the memory of the nodes that you're that you're running that load on, then the reality is you're you, you're probably um, making a lot of benefit, you're getting a lot of benefit from the cache and you're probably testing the speed of the cache as opposed to the speed of the storage system. So that's 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 a key factor. And of course, when you're trying to do apples for apples um, and uh, comparisons, being able to manage the environment and get dedicated um, compute and RAM and, and, and storage uh, QoS um, uh, for, for your environment is, is obviously going to be key. But also, don't forget, you know, that that often storage systems nowadays, especially with um, extremely fast SSDs and NVMe disks, um, can run at, at hundreds of thousands of of operations per second, and 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 often the the client executing the tests might also be the the, the bottleneck in in your in your perf in, in measuring performance or 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 the environment and not the and not the overall storage system. So. The important takeaway uh, out of all of this is um, run your own tests in your own environments with your with your own applications and, and try not to um, use uh, published uh, results because unless you actually understand all of those test conditions and all of the the potential gotchas, um, you, you you might have uh, you might not be comparing apples to apples. Um, the white paper uh, that we're developing is is open for um, comment. Uh, we really really appreciate um, uh, any contributions or or comments um, to 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 the document. Um, we're also working on uh, another document relating to um, availability and disaster recovery. Uh, this is this is a document that's uh, very close to one of our tech leads' hearts, Raffaele, um, who's who's been focusing on this for us. Um, we talk about um, we talk about availability and, and, and consistency, for example, in in the storage white paper. But but this document aims to to go down a bit further and and look at some of the architecture um, uh, considerations for implementing disaster recovery in cloud native environments so when we talk about high availability we're often uh, asking the question you know what happens when a component in in a failure domain is is lost so so perhaps you know a server or or, or a network connection or, or or something like that um so so the high availability is is a property that that allows the system to continue to 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 work in the presence of 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 some of these failures. When we talk about failure domain, it's you know we're we're looking at more than one individual component. You know, so we're looking at multiple nodes or a cluster or or, or perhaps um, an entire data center. Um, and so when we talk about disaster recovery, we're now we're now elevating availability to the failure of a, or, or the loss of an entire failure domain so what happens if you lose an entire cluster what happens if you lose a data center or or an availability zone say within a, within a cloud provider and the document talks about some of the considerations around um, availability versus consistency uh, with a discussion about the the cap theorem um, and the different consensus product protocols like raft and and, and paxis um, and we and we summarize, you know, how different solutions and different databases and, and different platforms optimize for um, implementing consistency guarantees um, or availability guarantees, because um, you can't obviously uh, with with the cap theorem, uh, you get you get two out of three effectively. Um, 
And we talk about the anatomy of a stateful application and how this translates to um, some of the some of the DR um, architectures. So so you know starting with the API layer, a coordination layer um, on the back end, and, and a storage layer that that may implement um, additional replicas for availability and, and, and charts for for scaling. But the idea here is, um, and, and this is just you know a sample reference architecture. The idea here is that um, uh, some sort of um, load balancing capability will will give you access to 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 multiple uh, ingresses and, and, and front ends that will be able to see um, a stateful um, that will be able to implement a stateful workload and persist the data. Um, in, a, in, a, in a consistent way across, um, you know, multiple failure domains in this, in this diagram, it's, it's different data centers, with the aim being that we're trying to provide an architecture that allows for automated failovers between, between uh, the different failure domains. So we have, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking to move away from the traditional view of disaster recovery where um, it's it's uh, implemented generally by human intervention where um, we have uh, recovery point objectives um, and recovery time objectives which, which are often measured in, in minutes to hours um, and where all of the technical capabilities just happen in the storage layer to a more um, uh, uh, a more uh, autonomous view where in, in a cloud native discovery, sorry, a cloud native disaster recovery um, process, we have um, autonomous processes to fail over across those different failure domains. Um, and if stateful synchronization is, is, is happening correctly and, and implemented correctly with that, that coordination and storage layer, um, you, of, you, you will often be able to reduce the recovery time and, and recovery point objectives um, and, but of course, that depends on um, the entire architecture from top to bottom um, being implemented uh, to, to facilitate this, this disaster recovery. So it's not just the storage layer, but also the, the, the networking and the east-west uh, communication and, and, and load balancing capabilities for that ingress. So again, this document is, um, we're, we're currently in the process of discussing this document uh, in the SIG calls. Um, and we have uh, we have some additional information in, in presentations that are um, that can be seen in the SIG minutes, and we'd definitely love to hear from you, and love to hear um, uh, have your feedback and and, and any comments um, uh, to the documents would be extremely um, uh, helpful. Um, and with that, we'd like to thank you um, for for your time. Um, Shing and myself will be online to take some questions um, and we'd love to to further on this discussion.